Interdependence, Unit 10, Lesson 4, Adaptations to Life and Water. So here's our Florida benchmark again, compare and contrast adaptations displayed by animals and plants that enable them to survive in different environments, such as life cycle variations, animal behaviors, and physical characteristics. And your scale, remember you do want to be a level three or higher. And our learning goal, the students will be able to compare and contrast adaptations displayed by animals and plants that enable them to survive in different environments. Okay, so this whole PowerPoint is going to be all about different bodies of water and the plants and animals that live there and their adaptations. So we're gonna start with lakes and ponds. Water on Earth can be salty or freshwater habitat. Lakes and ponds are wide bodies of water that do not flow very much. Plants grow near the shore. Animals, including ducks, snails, and fish, eat water plants. In the open water zone, floating plants called algae can grow. The deep water zone can contain fish, worms, and bacteria. There is no sunlight for plants to use. Snapping turtles, water lilies, and catfish are adapted to life in lakes and ponds. And most lakes and ponds have fresh water, meaning it is not salty. Plants in this part of the sandy shore play an important role in building sand dunes. Sea oats and American beach grass trap sand, forming sandy clumps that gradually develop into dunes. Over time, the wind blows the dunes towards the mainland, and more rows of dunes become established between the older dunes and the sea. Between the ridges are swales low-lying depressions between the ridges. More plants live here than on the unprotected side of the dunes facing the ocean. Even farther from the ocean, behind many rows of dunes, plants thicken into shrub and maritime forests. Maritime forests are pruned by salty maritime mist blowing through them. Maritime forests are old dunes rooted in place by vegetation. On rocky shorelines, the waves pound with great force. And life hangs onto rocks and crevices and collects in pools left by the rising and falling tide. Plants and animals often attach themselves tightly to the rock to keep from being swept away. And they each have a special zone to live in among the rocks. The video you just saw showed a little bit of the inner tidal zone, and we're gonna to get to that a little bit later in the PowerPoint. All right, so let's look at rivers and streams. Water in rivers and streams is always moving. So this is different from lakes and ponds. Lakes and ponds, it kind of just sits there, whereas rivers and streams are flowing. Faster the water moves, the harder it is for living things to make a home. Mosses, insects, fish, River otters, tadpoles, and green algae live in or near rivers and streams. Wetlands. A wetland is an area of land covered by a shallow layer of water for most of the year. Bogs, swamps, and marshes are three types of wetlands. Marshes are wetlands without trees. A salt marsh might be found on the protected back of a barrier island or near the mouth of a river that empties into the sea. A marsh is grass-covered land that's sometimes exposed when the tide is low and may be underwater when the tide is high. 
A salt marsh could be just a narrow strip at the water's edge, or a wide expanse of land miles across. A salt marsh is where fresh water from land mixes with salt water from the ocean. Water in a salt marsh is said to be brackish. It's not as salty as the ocean, but salty enough that only certain plants and animals can thrive. Marsh grasses have special salt glands on their leaves to excrete excess salt. They also have air tubes in their stems that transport oxygen to their roots buried deep in the mud. When marsh plants die, they decompose. Their leaves and stems rot. These decaying plants become an important food source for animals that live in the marsh. Relatively few different species can thrive in the marsh. The water is brackish. The land may sometimes be underwater and sometimes dry. But because the marsh grasses supply so much food, we find enormous numbers of creatures that do survive here. Many marine animals, such as crabs and oysters, that thrive in the salt marsh are very important food sources for humans. The lush grasses of the salt marsh also serve as a buffer between land and sea. The marsh absorbs the energy of waves and wind that might erode the shoreline. But the marsh is most important as a food source and nursery for the ocean. Before we realized how important salt marshes are, many marshes were cleared and filled in for building hotels and houses. Even today, marshes and the animals that live there are threatened by pollution. It's been said that a salt marsh is not quite land and not quite sea. It is a link between these worlds and is vital to the health of both. Wetlands are important habitats. They are home to many different kinds of plants and animals. Carnivorous plants, insects, snakes, alligators, Frogs and giant water rodents all live in wetland areas. So here's a quick question for you to think about. Why is the webbed bird foot in the image below a good adaptation for living in a wetland? The intertidal zone. The place where the ocean meets the coast is called the intertidal zone. Tides cover the intertidal zone with salt water for a part of the day. When the tide goes out, the intertidal zone is exposed to the air. So animals and plants that live there need to be able to survive underwater and when it is dry. If you walk across a sandy barrier island from the ocean to the sound, or climb up a rocky shoreline from the ocean to a high rock, you'll see change in the plants and animals that live there. The plants and animals in each habitat have adapted to the conditions in their particular world. Whether they live on a stormy, exposed beach,
tidal pool in an inland salty lake or in the calm of a maritime forest. When we go down to the low tide line, we enter a world that is as old as the earth itself the primeval meeting place of the elements of earth and water, a place of compromise and conflict and eternal change. Rachel Carson. On this shoreline, only the hardiest creatures can live on the part of the beach that is totally unprotected with waves, salt spray, and sunlight. You might think the open beach is barren. In fact, the beach is teeming with life. Animals that live above and below the sand. Animals large and small. rare sights, turtle hatchlings, boiling out of their sandy nests and heading for the safety of the sea. Loggerheads can grow to 9 feet and 850 pounds. shells, seaweed, and other life left on the shore by the ocean tide. The ghost crab is one of the most visible residents of this shoreline. Ghost crabs don't live entirely on land. They have gills. This master digger excavates deep tunnels in the sand where it can escape both the heat and predators at the surface and wet its gill. If we visit a coral reef, we'll see about as much sand as we do coral. Sand flats often border coral reefs. Most of this sand is the product of years of work by parrotfish. Parrotfish have special mouths, very similar to a parrot's beak, and they graze on coral. They digest the algae growing on the coral, but they excrete the calcium carbonate, the coral rock ground into sand. When we look at these sand flats, we might think they are a desert. We often see little alive, just a stingray cruising the sand. But this ray should give us a clue that there is more here than meets the eye. This ray is feeding. Like the ray, this goatfish is feeding on animals too small to be seen that live in and on the sand. Like many animals that live on the sand, the pale goatfish is designed to blend in against the sand. Another common resident of the sand flats is this sand tilefish. The white tilefish is nearly invisible against the white sand. The mouth of this fish is well adapted for picking tiny animals from the bottom. The jawfish uses its excavating abilities to build a home in the sand. 
The jawfish uses its mouth for the nearly constant job of scooping sand out of its hole. It shores up the entrance to its hole with small rocks. The jawfish will hover above its hole and gobble up tiny creatures that drift by. Another resident of the sand flats is the conch. The conch moves almost imperceptibly across the bottom, raising for food and leaving a trail through the sand. Sea cucumbers like this spiny sea cucumber also graze the sand bottom. The sea cucumber pumps water and sand through its body, filtering out nutrients. eels are another creature well adapted to life in the sand. These eels are frequently found burrowed in large gardens. To feed, the eels rise from their burrows and pick food out of the water. Garden eels are extremely shy, and if any larger animal, like this diver, approaches, the eels will slide back into the safety of their holes. Many different animals live on the sand flats, but they all have one thing in common. They all have special adaptations that help them thrive in sand country. Living things in the intertidal zone must have adaptations to prevent being crushed, washed away, or dried out by the sun. Seaweed, sea stars and sea urchins, barnacles, clams and oysters, tube worms and anemones live in the intertidal zone. Estuaries, whether consisting of the cool waters of Tillamook Bay or the warm waters of a tropical mangrove lagoon, are much richer in the microorganisms which make up plankton than either the open ocean or freshwater rivers. Planktonic or free-floating organisms and organic debris washed into the bay by rivers provide the basic source of food for the animals who live on the bottom of the bay. Many of these bottom-dwelling animals are found only in estuary environments, and it is undoubtedly these bottom-dwellers who predominate there. They belong to a number of different animal phyla, and most are filter feeders who strain the water to obtain food. They've had to develop different strategies for survival, since during low tides, large portions of the bottom of the bay are exposed directly to the drying effects of wind and sun. And even though they are exposed to the air, mudflats are actually oxygen poor due to the activity of the bacteria, which consume oxygen as they decompose the organic debris which collects on the mud flats. This mud usually contains a high concentration of sulfides, produced as a byproduct of bacterial processes, which can cause it to release an unpleasant odor. In spite of all this, bottom-dwelling creatures have adapted to life in this unlikely habitat. If we look at the surface of a tidal mudflat, we see that it is covered with innumerable tiny craters. Each crater indicates an animal concealed below the surface. Here they wait, protected by moist mud and sand for the incoming tide which brings with it food and oxygen. An eruption of water through a crater is a good sign that a clam, one of the commonest bottom dwellers, is headed for safety deep below the surface. Clams are bivalves or two-shelled mollusks and can exist in fantastic numbers in estuaries. It is interesting to catch a clam. This type is called a cockle. Place it in a shallow pool of water and watch how it buries itself in the sand. At first, the shell is tightly closed for protection. 
After a short time of being undisturbed, the shell will open slightly. Normally, clams dwell in the bay mud and extend pairs of tubular siphons up through the surface into the water. Clams filter the water passing through the siphons for particles of food and at the same time extract oxygen for respiration. The clam can pump water through its siphons and create a kind of jet propulsion system used for burrowing. A process aided by the use of a large fleshy foot. Not all of the craters found on tidal flats are formed by clams. Some conceal worms from a number of different phyla. Most belong to the same phylum as the common earthworm called the annelida, or segmented worms. Some, like this clam worm, can be found living in clam burrows. Others, like feather duster worms, are tube-dwelling annelids which possess feathery tentacles used to trap food particles and pass them by the action of cilia into their mouths. The bottoms of bays are sometimes thick with forests of these worms. Here we see how the tentacles of a terabella worm can be spread over a great distance in an active search for food. One rather rare and unusual worm occasionally encountered is the sipunculid or peanut worm. It can swallow great quantities of mud and sand from which it extracts organic material. When removed from its burrow, it will alternately extend and pull back one end of its body, to which a ring of tentacles is attached. The worm-like cusk eel is a type of bony fish also found living in clam burrows where it waits for unsuspecting prey. Organisms like the clam, cusk eel, and clam worm, which share dwellings without harming one another, are called commensals. Certain joint-legged invertebrates, such as this nearly transparent ghost shrimp, also can be found sharing burrows with clams. Ghost shrimps can exist in such great numbers in certain bays that oyster farmers consider them pests because they can disturb the oyster beds. Oyster farming is an interesting activity often encountered in estuaries. Oyster farmers place old oyster shells which contain immature oyster larvae into the bay, where they are allowed to grow for several years before being harvested. Like clams, oysters are bivalve mollusks, but their shells are oddly twisted depending on how crowded they were as they grew. An especially unusual feature of oysters is that they change sexes. One year they are male, and the next female. Scallops are another common type of bay-dwelling mollusk. Between this scallop's two shells can be seen rows of finger-like sensory devices. And between them are spherical eyes. When a predator such as a starfish comes near, the scallop can sense the approach chemically and will slam its shells together, causing water to be expelled so rapidly it can actually leap out of danger. Estuaries also contain bottom-dwelling members of the phylum Cnidaria. Among these organisms are burrowing sea anemones and sea pens. Sea pens have the property of bioluminescence, and will give off a flash of brilliant orange light if disturbed in the dark. Some estuaries contain unbelievable numbers of bottom-dwelling crabs. Immature crabs can be found by turning over almost any moist rock in Tillamook Bay. The tiny crabs congregate under rocks during low tide to keep moist and to protect themselves from hordes of hungry birds. It is not surprising, therefore, that estuaries provide excellent sites for commercial crabbing operations. Estuaries, whether 
consisting of the cool waters of Tillamook Bay or the warm waters of a tropical mangrove lagoon are much richer in the microorganisms which make up plankton than either the open ocean or freshwater rivers. Planktonic or free-floating organisms and organic debris washed into the bay by rivers provide the basic source of food for the animals who live on the bottom of the bay. Many of these bottom-dwelling animals are found only in estuary environments. And it is undoubtedly these bottom-dwellers who predominate there. They belong to a number of different animal phyla, and most are filter feeders who strain the water to obtain food. They've had to develop different strategies for survival, since during low tides, large portions of the bottom of the bay are exposed directly to the drying effects of wind and sun. And even though they are exposed to the air, mudflats are actually oxygen poor due to the activity of the bacteria which consume oxygen as they decompose the organic debris which collects on the mudflats. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at this quick question. What adaptations allow a clam to survive in the intertidal zone? Ocean life. The ocean is the largest habitat on Earth. Light reaches the top zone of the ocean, known as the photic zone. The aphotic zone is very dark and cold. In that word aphotic, the first part of the word a is actually um, a part of the word that means not or none. So there's no light because photic comes from photo. Um, that root means light. So photic zone is light zone. Aphotic zone is basically no light zone. The ocean floor is covered with mountains, valleys, and canyons. There are undersea volcanoes and hot springs called vents. Common plants and animals are dolphins, sharks, tube worms, jellyfish, and seaweed. What are some special ocean adaptations? Since humans are land animals, they can't survive very long in the ocean unless they have special equipment. Equipment like this scuba gear or deep sea vessels allow humans to enter the ocean world. Animals like fish, whales, and penguins all have special adaptations which allow them to live naturally in or by the sea. Adaptations like body shape and functions, color and camouflage, all help sea creatures specially adapt to life in the ocean. Fish need oxygen to live, but unlike humans, fish have special body functions which allow them to get oxygen from water. A fish has gills instead of lungs. There are little holes on each side of his head. As the water goes into the gills, it passes over the blood vessels. Oxygen goes from the water through the thin walls of the blood vessels into the fish's blood. Most fish have streamlined bodies, ideal for fast swimming in ocean water. The fins, which grow out of the sides of their bodies and under their stomachs, are used for balance, for steering, and for brakes. Fish also have what is called a swim bladder in the middle of their bodies. Much like an inflated balloon, this swim bladder helps them to float and not sink to the bottom of the ocean. Color is also important. These penguins are ocean birds which have dark colored backs and light bellies. This is actually a special adaptation called countershading. This protective coloration helps them hide from predators. When they are in the water and an enemy is above them, 
the enemy sees only the penguins' dark backs against a dark ocean and thinks nothing is there. If the enemy is below them, he sees only their light-colored bellies against the bright sky. In this way, their background helps hide them. This clown triggerfish lives in the coral reefs. The spots and stripes break up the body shape and make it hard to see in its coral reef habitat. The shape of this bay pipefish makes it ideal for hiding in seagrass. These wondrous creatures are called jellyfish. Jellyfish have no backbone. Animals without backbones are called invertebrates. Jellyfish eat other animals. Their dangling tentacles emit a poison which paralyzes their prey. Another invertebrate is this strange creature called a sea anemone. Like jellyfish, they also have stinging tentacles used for protection and to stun their prey. This sea anemone and clownfish have a special relationship with each other called a partnership. Partnerships exist when two or more life forms help each other survive. In this case, the clownfish enjoy a safe home for themselves and their young amongst the stinging tentacles of the sea anemone to which they are immune. In return, the bright colors of the clownfish help lure other fish for the anemone to eat. Sharks are also incredible ocean creatures. Their razor sharp teeth for hunting other fish and sleek body for speed allow them to thrive as hunters. Coral bleaching occurs when a coral reef loses its color. Rising water temperatures and ocean pollution may be causes for coral bleaching. Taking too many fish from the ocean can cause other animals to become extinct. Remember, everything is connected. But recently, Carollo and others have observed other more ominous threats to coral reefs. In 1993, we started a program we call our photo monitoring program with Reef Relief. We would tell people, look, the reef doesn't look as good this year as it did last year. So we decided to start going underwater with a camera and a video camera, still a camera and a video camera, and take pictures of the same corals, coral formations from the same angle over a period of time throughout the years. Now, when we first started this program, we were under the impression, because our coral reefs here in Florida Keys are well over 5,000 years old, um, we, we figured we wouldn't see any changes for years and years and years. The most amazing thing was we found coral diseases. We found these strange new things that were affecting the coral and in fact were killing the coral at a very rapid rate. Different diseases have afflicted many of the world's coral reefs. In some places, coral polyps have ejected the colorful algae that live inside them. Because the coral that remains is white, Scientists call this mysterious affliction bleaching. Other reefs are suffering from black band disease, named for the leading edge of the infection which forms a black band. Scientists are still trying to understand these diseases and many others. In the last 10 years, there have been a whole host of new coral diseases that have shown up. And the most alarming part of it is that we don't have most of them identified. For only two or three of them are the actual causative pathogens identified. And so we have coral killers that are wiping out 100-year-old coral heads literally in months. 
and yet we don't know what the, what the causative agent is for these. While the exact causes of most of these diseases is still unclear, most scientists believe that they are caused by changes in the quality of the water. Some of these changes are the result of pollution from rapidly developing communities in South Florida. This pollution may introduce into the water bacteria, viruses, and fungi that are harmful to corals. Pollution may also weaken corals so that they can't fight off infections that they normally could handle. Another factor may be the changing temperatures of the tropical waters. Corals can grow only in clear water whose temperature is at least 71 degrees Fahrenheit, but no greater than 86 degrees. But recently, temperatures in the Caribbean have at times exceeded these limits. These warmer temperatures may be a sign of increasing temperatures worldwide, a phenomenon known as global warming. If global warming were to cause significant sea surface temperature increases, it could create an environment that would be very favorable for disease-causing agents, as well as an environment in which the corals would be stressed and thus more susceptible to disease. And so global warming is something of a frightening prospect for reefs that are already beleaguered by diseases. The causes of global warming? Once again, we humans are strongly implicated. Many scientists think that if global warming is occurring, it is because of an accumulation of pollutants in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels. Cars, coal burning factories, and power plants are major sources of these pollutants. Humans are implicated in other problems afflicting coral reefs. Corals can grow only in clear water near the surface. The algae that grow in coral polyps need clear water to perform photosynthesis. In order for the water to remain clear, it has to be largely free of nutrients. Nutrients include chemicals such as phosphates and nitrates found in fertilizers. In recent years, thousands of tons of these chemicals used in agriculture have run off the land and reached the ocean. Fertilizers used in lawns and golf courses are other important sources of this kind of pollution. Nutrients have also come from inadequately treated sewage from developed areas along the Florida coast. These nutrients promote the growth of algae that rob the water of oxygen and make the water less clear. Recently, Craig Kirolo of Reef Relief and others have found algae growing over and around the reefs near the Florida Keys. This rapid growth of harmful algae is called an algal bloom. The algae that results from excessive nutrients compete with the good algae that live inside polyps, and they compete with corals for space to grow. The different kinds of damage being done to coral reefs have wider implications. Coral reefs are important indicators of the health of the Earth's oceans. As we develop more and more near shores, we pollute more and more into our oceans, the corals are the species that are telling us that we have a problem. They've, they've been around the planet for hundreds of millions of years, and when we see them die and disappear in a matter of 10 or 20 years, we have to re reflect and think about what, what problems we may be causing to the oceans themselves. If reefs continue to suffer and die, we risk losing unique ecosystems full of life forms that are found nowhere else on Earth. The loss would be enormous in other ways as well. People in many parts of the world would lose an important source of nutrition because they depend on different kinds of reef life for food. Communities that depend on healthy reefs to attract tourists would lose a source of income. And scientists, like Drew Harvell, might lose important resources in their search for treatments and cures for a variety of human diseases. It's only now that we're developing a catalog of interesting, important chemicals from reefs. We haven't made many of the discoveries that are out there to make. And even once we've discovered those, we haven't even started to tinker with the genetic machinery that we could then harness 
in, in producing some of these compounds ourselves. And so it's vital that we protect these resources that we've barely even been able to investigate. It is perhaps inevitable that a program about coral reefs should end by focusing on us, on human beings. Coral reefs now attract millions of snorkelers, divers, and boaters every year. But the sheer number of these visitors threatens the beauty and variety of life that bring them there. Visitors can do much to save the world's coral reefs by learning to observe and enjoy them without harming them. Even those of us who never visit or see a reef can play an important part in saving them. We can cut down on the burning of fossil fuels that may contribute to global warming. We can cut down on pollution that threatens reefs with disease. We can reduce the use of fertilizers and other nutrients that reach tropical waters and result in the harmful growth of algae. If we humans have become the primary threat to coral reefs, we also can do much to save them. The health and even the survival of the world's coral reefs depend largely on us. Chemicals from trash dumped in the ocean can be harmful to sea life. Living things can get caught in the trash. A lot of times sea turtles get stuck in um, those little plastic rings that your soda cans come in when you buy a six pack of Coca-Cola. Um, so make sure you guys always cut those up into pieces before they go into the trash. You don't want any sea animals to get stuck in them. Also plastic bags, like Walmart grocery bags, they get into the ocean. Sea turtles will think they're jellyfish, which is a source of food, and they'll try to eat them and it can be extremely harmful. Ocean currents can carry trash from far away places. Back to your learning goal, the students will be able to compare and contrast adaptations displayed by animals and plants that enable them to survive in different environments. Okay, so real quick, we are at the end of the plant and animal adaptations unit. So I just have something for you to think about. You do not need to actually complete this at this time. I would just like you to take a moment to think about it. All right, so exit slip, are you a three? If you remember, when we look back at our scale, I have said from the beginning that your goal is to be a three or higher. Okay, so here are the two questions to think about. Number one, explain how when the environment changes, differences between individuals allow some plants and animals to survive and reproduce while others die or move to new locations. Give at least one example. So try to think of at least one example. Again, you don't have to write this down, just think about it. Come up in your mind with at least one example of how differences between certain organisms allow some to survive while others die. And number two, compare and contrast adaptations displayed by animals and or plants that enable them to survive in different environments. Give at least one example. So try to think of something where you're comparing, showing how organisms are alike or contrasting how they're different, um, how the adaptations might help one survive in a certain environment but the other not.